Hi, my name is Helen Walsh. Uh, I'm the president of Diaspora Dialogues, and we're absolutely delighted that you've joined us uh, for today's talk with Michael DeBoeuf, uh, presented in partnership with the Artist Legal Advice Services on understanding defamation and other legal considerations. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that Diaspora Dialogues operates on land that is the traditional territory of the Huron, Wendat, and Piton First Nations, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Anishinaabeg and Allied Nations to care for and share the resources about, around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and we are privileged to live, work and create in this territory and strive to act with awareness and solidarity. Uh, I'm going to introduce, so the, the topic is one that's uh, clearly very important to any writers uh, who are putting works out into the world, uh, or who, in fact, who are engaging on social media as well. Um, it is often the topic that defamation and libel that we don't know enough about until it's too late. And by the time that we need to know, uh, we generally are in a little bit of a, a situation. Uh, so Michael DeBoff is a Canadian entertainment lawyer with professional focus on music, film, and television, publishing, and corporate matters. He's worked with a variety of artists and creative businesses, helping to facilitate projects, performance opportunities locally and across borders, and organizational matters. Born and raised in Winnipeg, Michael's practice spans across Manitoba, where he carries on clients and representation, in addition to the firm's primary residence in Ontario. Prior to working as a lawyer, Michael's worked professionally in both the music and TV film industries, as a musician in an alternative rock band, and as a freelance director, writer, and producer in Toronto and Vancouver. He's a creative writer as well, uh, with short stories we were just speaking about, so he knows this area well. His passion for the art and artists helps drive his practice and makes him grateful to be able to continue to work for and with vibrant arts communities. So a very warm welcome to you, Michael. Um, we're delighted that you're here. And we are going to, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Michael now. He's gonna speak for about a half an hour uh, and then we will open it up to Q and A. So feel free at any point if you'd like to put your questions in the chat and I'll keep track of them. Uh, and we'll circle back to those questions in about a half an hour. So take it away, Michael. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you as well, Christian. It's great to be back again. We had a session together in the fall and I hope that we have some recurring uh, audience members that you know got something out of the first session and came back for round two. So as Helen mentioned, defamation is obviously a, a popular topic, very relevant for writers of every variety. Uh, there is quite a lot to talk about in the uh, within this topic, but Today, uh, we're going to kind of move through it fairly quickly uh, with the hope that, you know, the core tenets of this area of law are kind of established. You have a few key takeaways, and then we can open it up to discussion uh, at the end. Uh, I just want to give a brief disclaimer that anything talked about today does not constitute formal legal advice, but you will have my contact information by the end of our session, and you can always feel free to reach out if you have any follow-up questions. So we will jump right into it. So what is defamation and why is it relevant? Well, one of the primary kind of competing factors when it comes to defamation is the balance between freedom of expression and the protection of private reputation. So these are two kind of ideologies or tenets that is kind of, it, it helps to keep these in the back of your mind as we work through this, uh, this topic today. What is defamation though from a legal standpoint? It is a tort. Uh, and on that, it is a strict liability tort. So that means that once the primary elements are established, you don't need to actually prove damages or falsity um, in order to have an act in order to have an, an actionable tort. So you can be liable for damages as soon as the, the core elements are proved. And we will get into what those elements are in just a second. So uh, a kind of uh, way to summarize the the tenant, the key uh, the key matter of what defamation is, is that it's a false statement about an individual, business, or organization that harms the reputation 
as and is communicated to a third party. So that breaking that down into a few components, we have three three items here. One is that the statement is false. You know, that's that's one of the most important pieces. If it's not false, then it is not actionable. So we'll see also shortly that, you know, uh, justification or the truth of the statement is one of the strongest defenses you can have. And as soon as that's proved, you know, the, the it's not defamatory and it's not actionable. So that's one thing that's important to keep in mind. Second is that it lowers the individual's reputation in the eyes of a reasonable person. So, you know, there's a bit to unpack there, but it means that I, I am making a statement that lowers the reputation. So it could be professionally, it can be, you know, in any context, one that, you know, harms or lowers the reputation. And the bar there is, is quite low, to be honest. Um, you know, it's easy to make an argument that someone's reputation is lowered. Um, so that's kind of something that, that can be established, you know, fairly quickly. Um, in that, what's important is that the statement has to be able to identify an individual. So again, this is relevant, particularly to writers, as something to keep in mind. If you ever have any concerns out about the nature of what you're writing, you know, again, ask yourself, can you, can you identify with confidence who the subject matter is of this statement? Because, you know, tailoring the writing to lower this, this question is, is, you know, something that we advise quite often uh, when we're talking about this topic uh, with our clients. So, you know, kind of masking or altering writing in some way to make it so that an ind the precise individual is not identifiable is, is a strong practice, just in general. You know, it lowers, it lowers risks significantly. And lastly, and maybe um, more obviously, is that this statement has to be communicated to a third party. So this can be a, as little as one single person, but it has to be communicated in, in some way. Uh, it, 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 although it, it's not, uh, it doesn't really matter if it's intentional or careless. It's simply the fact that it's communicated um, either orally or through written word, uh, either can constitute defamation. And as you see here, with the, if the statement is written, it constitutes libel. And if it's an oral statement, it constitutes, or the term is slander. Um, so these are the, this is kind of like the, the main summary of what defamation is. Um, any questions there, Helen? Anything to elaborate on? Somebody has a question right now saying, does defamation have to be in writing or can a photo uh, that, uh, can a yeah. photo showing a person doing something bad be defamation? Yeah, that, that's a great question. It actually can. It can, it, there can be a defamatory image. Um, in that case, it would still, you know, it'd still be liable because it's written down. It's, you know, fixed to a form as opposed to an oral statement. But, you know, a, a certain mani manipulated photo of some kind can be defamatory. Again, it's, it's, it's a bit contextual then because, you know, if, a, if an image is false or true is kind of a separate conversation. But in reality, you can kind of get into the same analysis of a photo that you would, that you would use for, you know, a written word statement. And what so, about an individual versus an institution? We have a few questions we'll deal with in a group before we move on. Uh, if it's an institution and not an individual, can you libel them or defame them? Yes, you can. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. can the third uh, can the third party be a bunch of people on social media? That's a good question. I, I don't believe so. I would kind of have to hear a little bit more about what like what the question is or the type of scenario, but from my understanding, and you know, I can always follow up with this. I don't believe that like a communal group um, can be can be defamed. Okay. Well, why don't we have two more? Do you want to deal with mm -hmm. them now, or move on and and uh, sure? Deal with yeah, if, if they're relevant to to you know the, the summary discussion, sure thing. Uh, well, this one's a bit broader. So, when writing a memoir, how do you bulletproof yourself as much as possible? Uh, against people who do harm. Why don't we leave uh, that one till later? Because that's a that's a not a, about this particular one, but a yeah. bigger one. And um, I'll be speaking to that kind of as we go through this talk today. Okay. I'll kind of be speaking to that in a general sense. Okay. And this last one before we move on, 
I've heard that it is not libelous to use information in the public record, but what constitutes public record? Is that something we'll deal with as we go on or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, so, well, well, let's move forward and then we can always circle back uh, and make sure these questions were answered. Okay, Jane and Fazila? Okay. So just continuing with the overall summary of defamation. So the limitation period for bringing a claim uh, in defamation is two years from the date of discovery. So that's the date that the, the plaintiff, the one who was defamed, discovered the statement. If it wasn't discovered, then, then the period begins, the, the limitation period begins on the date of the statement that it was made. There are some exceptions to, to this uh, second rule here, and that's in certain cases where, um, you know, the, the plaintiff was not able to bring the commence to claim or if two, the person who made the statement you know, willfully obscured the statement so that the plaintiff could not discover it. But generally speaking, as with uh, you know a lot of the core torts, it's a two-year limitation period. As mentioned before, proving that a statement is, har is harmful is, is fairly easy to do. Um, it's kind of the other pieces around that um, that become more relevant within the analysis in, in, in many cases. So once the plaintiff proves that the statement was defamatory, there's a presumption that the statement was false. The burden then shifts to the defendant, who in this context is the person who makes the statement, on a balance of probabilities that the statement was true or falls into one of the other established defenses, which we'll get into in just a moment. Um, what a balance of probability probabilities means is that it's greater than 50% likely. So you know, this is kind of getting into a more legal discussion, but it's, it's uh, as opposed to beyond a reasonable doubt for criminal actions, which is, you know, more or less 99%, balance of probabilities is just greater than 50%. Um, so it's a much lower bar to prove. Remedies. So again, this applies to the plaintiff, someone who brings an action in defamation, what remedies are available to them? Well, firstly, there's damages. So that's the payment of a sum. There is general damages that cover non-economic losses, which are things like damage to reputation, embarrassment, and humiliation. And then there's special damages, which are for often unique situations, which includes quantifiable economic losses, such as loss of income and profits. So this, you know, this is relevant for any kind of legal action, damages, our payment of money from the defendant to the plaintiff. Uh, sometimes the other direction as well, but that's a separate conversation. Uh, secondly, there's injunctions. So that's uh, stopping an action from occurring. So for example, uh, if it's a novel that, that, that contains a defamatory statement, there might be an injunction to stop publishing that, that novel, or in another way, you may have to edit it to remove that, that piece before you can republish it. But the injunction is an order to stop something from, from occurring. Um, there may also be apologies or retractions. Uh, these are more unique, I'd say, apology in particular, but retraction would be something perhaps, like if there was a news article that was put out that was found to be defamatory, perhaps the, the publication has to put out a new statement where they explicitly retract the statement that was previously made that was found to be defamatory. So th these are three of the uh, common uh, options for remedies that may be available to within a, a, a defamatory action. Next are the defenses. So there are, there are a few more defenses than what's listed here, but I'm gonna just go through these ones because they're probably more relevant to the audience that's, that's part of this talk. Um, so as mentioned, truth or justification is probably the strongest um, defense that, that you can have. Um, that's because, you know, as soon as you prove something is true, it cannot be defamatory. So it's not even an exception to, to, the, to, to uh, defamation. It's actually a, a complete defense. So if you're able to prove that what you said is true, then it cannot be defamatory and an action cannot succeed. Next is fair comment. So um, there's a few different requirements for what fair comment, uh, for establishing fair, the fair comment defense. 
um, but generally it's providing a few a viewpoint on a topic that's of public significance. Um, so these are the kind of the, the elements here. It's one public interest. It's based on verifiable fact, which is the comment is based on that. It's recognizable as a comment and it's honestly expressed. It's an honestly expressed opinion based on those proven facts. That's kind of combining them together. Um, again, this will apply oftentimes more for reporting. It's a bit harder to, um, to you know, justify or establish def this defense for a narrative, you know, novel or something like that, um, unless it's you know very clearly nonfiction and um, this is more of a commentary type of piece. Um, after that, there's qualified privilege. So uh, this is where an individual actually has a specific duty to uh, divulge this information. So an, a, an easy example is during a legal proceeding or perhaps during a like a political meeting of some kind in the House of uh, like the Senate or something like that. Um, that would be an instance where qualified privilege would um, would apply. Lastly is innocent dissemination. So this actually occurs where the party making the statement was unaware of the nature of the statement. Again, this is a bit of a more unique situation, but today particularly with uh, with uh, social media and items like that, you know, you can kind of repost or forward something without really thinking about it. And that's the kind of situation where innocent dissemination may apply. Uh, again, it would be much harder to prove, it, prove that if you are creating the words yourself. Um, and then there, there's malice. So malice uh, can actually defeat some of the defenses even after they've been proven. Um, in particular, it can often defeat fair comment or qualified uh, privilege. But in this case where malice is put forward, it, the burden again shifts back to the plaintiff who must prove that malice existed. Um, generally speaking, uh, malice involves, you know, knowing that the statement was false or, you know, being completely reckless or careless in, in making the statement or more, you know, clearly there, there was an intent to injure uh, the plaintiff with, with making the statement. So it's a brief um, summary of some of the, the core defenses to defamation. And so now kind of the most maybe the most important slide and general discussion here, we can kind of open it up again. Uh, I believe this may be the last slide. It is. So these are kind of the questions to ask yourself and the bullet points to kind of go through as you're writing. And when you're kind of considering whether something is defamatory, what to do, how to analyze it and so on. So firstly is looking at whether the statement is de defamatory. You know, look at, consider it, is what you're writing fiction versus nonfiction? If it's nonfiction, is, are, are the statements about a particular real entity or individual? Can the subject matter, can the subject be identified? You know, you want to remove yourself from, from the analysis here because a lot of this always comes down to the reasonable person question. So if a reasonable person, so it's just like a, a usual person in society, were to read the statement, and it's not only the, the sentence itself, often you have to use the context of what's written around it. Perhaps it's a whole story, perhaps it's, it's a few paragraphs or pages. Uh, putting that all together, can we uh, identify with confidence who this, this subject is, and is it a real person? So again, what is the nature of the statement? Is it a disparaging comment? Is it critical? Is it targeted? Um, what is the objective of, of making that statement? Then if you kind of, you know, have an inkling that this might be defamatory or still have some concerns, then ask these questions. Is the statement itself necessary? So this is, this is a conversation I often have with clients where, you know, you have to ask, like, do I need to say these things? Does it forward the objective of my narrative, narrative or story? Does it add anything? or does removing it you know, not have any impact? If it is necessary, can it be altered in some way? So this again goes back to what I said previously is something that's common is changing the names uh, from real names to uh, made up names, altering other details, you know, maybe attributes, physical attributes or settings, dates, anything like that to again, lessen that ability to identify 
who the who the subject is. And then another 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 question, which a lot of people don't consider, is can I obtain consent? Because at the end of the day, if it's based on a real person, but you know they might consent for whatever reason. If you can get that in writing, that itself you know could be a, a complete defense for you. If they're consenting to whatever you're you're wanting to write and putting that in writing, then that's all you need. Um, so that's something to consider. You know, it might not seem reasonable to you as the writer, especially depending on what you're writing, but it's something to think about or just to keep in the back of your mind. Then another practical element is at the end of the day, if it's defamatory, what like knowing who the who the subject is, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's an organization you worked with, whoever it might be, is to ask about the risk analysis. You know, what's the practicality or or the probability of this individual or entity actually bringing an action? You know, in some cases there might be history there, or you may have received an overt message saying, you know, don't write about this event. In that case, you know, you've already been brought to attention that you know they don't want you saying these things. Then there's also the monetary uh, factor. Like, do they have the means to bring in action? Um, so all this is kind of the kind of breakdown of, you know, elements to ask yourself, questions to ask, and then to kind of come up with a, a final risk assessment at the end of the day of, you know, where do things lie with the statement that you're considering writing and what it might lead to. So that is a very brief um, kind of run through of, you know, some of the core ideas concerning defamation, risks of defamation, and how to protect yourself. So maybe I'll I'll shift it back to Helen now. Maybe she wants to ask some questions or there might be some in the chat, but we can open it up a bit at this point after my very you know speedy run through of, of this topic. Well, that's terrific, Michael. Thank you. It's um, <clears throat> There's quite a few uh, questions in the chat, so I think we'll get right to them. Uh, it's mm -hmm. now on a time check. It's uh, it's about 10 to 1, so we have until 1.30, so we've got some time uh, to go through the questions. Um, so we'll go back to Jane's question, which I, and just double check that uh, uh, that we answered it. So there are two questions in the chat, both about memoirs. So I'll give them to you both at the same time. Yeah. Uh, Jane's question was, when writing a memoir about, about I'm not sure, how do you bulletproof yourself as much as possible against people who did harm? Um, and we can ask her follow-up questions if we need to. Uh, and then Michelle writes, uh, I'm writing a memoir. If I write about, say, a medical team and depict them in the way that I remember how events happened, how can I protect myself from getting sued? Should I just leave names out? Right. So a few, uh, like the answers in general, I think I, I kind of talked about a bit here. But, you know, again, the big, the best defense you can have is truth. And the one item that you have to consider when it comes to truth, to truth is how do you actually prove that? And, and I have this conversation about memoirs every now and then because these are historical events. Um, how do you prove that these happened? You know, at the end of the day, they may 100% 100 be true, but if you can't prove it, you know, that poses new risk for you. So in some cases, uh, you know, there's other individuals that could assist you with with verifying events that happened. In other cases, there's documents and things like that that might assist you. But you have to, you know, knowing that there's the risk of a claim being brought, uh, being brought you have to kind of go through the analysis yourself of, of understanding how do I prove this if I have to. You know, even if the thing is true, if you don't have that uh, strong evidence that you might have to produce, Again, you might want to go backwards and consider whether you should be making these statements. Um, you know, we do, I, I've come across other cases where it's been memoir based and they want the, the individual wanted to write about, you know, some pretty uh, distressing events that happened in their life. And some, you know, might be, might have constituted crimes and things like that. And so, you know, are there records that you that you can rely upon? Are there things like that that again will establish or help to prove the the truth of these events? So that's one thing. And then two is also what is the nature of the statement you're making? If you're simply stating that something happened, 
um, you know, that's more, that's easier to prove. If you're adding commentary on top of, you know, those strong statements, is that shifting the nature of the statement? You know, as soon as it becomes more commentary based, then you lose that you know ability to to use truth as a defense if it's just if it's just opinion. There's fair comment then, but again, it's it's a little bit more contextual then, and it's not a uh, it's not a sure defense, or it's the uh, the strength of the defense is more contextual based, I, I'd say, or context based. Um, can you, I think that was more about the first question. Can you repeat the second question again about the medical team? Yeah, and I think this probably also relates to the question about, you know, probability of bringing in action when, when you're facing uh, a sector as well, uh, funded as the healthcare sector. But uh, I, if I write about a medical team and depict them in the way that I remember how events happened, can I protect myself from getting sued? Should I just leave names out? Right. Specific so, names of doctors and folks in the, in the medical team. Yeah. So leaving names out is always a great practice that helps to minimize risk greatly. Um, you know, based on that question, it kind of framed it where you're relying on upon your own memory. So again, right right off the bat, it's not it's not uh, as it's not very quite verifiable if you're just simply going by memory. Again, the more you can rely upon verifiable facts the better your defense. And then the last thing that kind of triggers for me when I hear that scenario is that, you know, if you worked as an employee or in some sort of uh, capacity for this organization, you know, you should look at any contracts you may have entered. There could be confidentiality clauses where that's a whole separate issue to defamation, but you could be breaching uh, the contract if you're speaking to or divulging information that, that might be covered by a, a confidentiality clause. So Fazila asks, I've heard it's not libelous to use information in the public record, but what constitutes the public record? I, I'm not too sure what, what that is referring to. It seems like it's uh, fairly contextual. I, maybe this is best for a separate conversation with this individual, but it, like what comes to mind is just the whole nature of being able to prove um, that a statement is true. And if it's based on facts that are in the that are known publicly, that's a pretty strong defense. So that's the whole idea to me. What what that makes me think of is just you know facts that are known to the public, and using that as the basis of the statement for uh, of a statement. Okay, Todd asks, what about a situation where a statement is unclear whether it is factual or not? Is an errors and omissions document sufficient to protect yourself from a defamation suit? So two different questions. Uh, firstly, I would definitely not make any controversial statements if you're basing it on a on whatever information that you do not know if it's true or not. That sounds like a very risky, risky endeavor. Uh, secondly, errors and, and omission. Generally, that's like for my practice that refers to a, a policy of insurance that's kind of called errors and omission. However, one of the elements of you know acquiring one of those policies is as affirming that none of the content of what you're producing is defamatory to the best of your knowledge. So if you know that there's a risk of defamation and you don't state that in your application, then you may be then you may be in breach of the policy or you know the whole policy kind of fall, could fall apart if you're uh, not being truthful with the risks present. Todd, do you want to put in the chat whether whether that is what you're referring to? I mean, are you referring to a statement within a book that says this may or may not be true versus versus a uh, an insurance? Okay, we can circle back to that. Um, Rohit asks if an individual posts something that is liable against another individual on social media on their profile, can there be a case for defamation? Yeah, de defamation can occur. Again, it can be communicated in any way. So that includes social media. Um, something to add there is that if a statement is made and that statement is then disseminated through, you know, multiple avenues uh, that could be, you know, attributed to different individuals, 
each one of those disseminations can constitute a new act of defamation. So potentially, I'll say. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. You know, you if something is risky, the statement, and it just goes out into the ether and you know goes around, you could be exposing yourself to quite a bit of risk. But absolutely, uh, social media, you can defame someone within any of those um, outlets. I was curious, Michael, when you talked about, and we have more questions, I'll go back to in a minute. Yep. When you talked about a defense being innocent dissemination and you used the example of reposting of social media, uh, I'd always heard or known of defamation as uh, if you repeat something that's not true, even if you don't fully realize what you're doing, you're still actually liable. Is that not the case? It is the case. It, it's quite, uh, this is the, you know, what every lawyer says for most conversations. It's very contextual. So it's case by case analysis where you're absolutely right. You can still be found liable for defamation. Um, it's really, if you would no way to prove it, um, you know, there's specific examples for innocent dissemination. And the, the example that's often brought up is, you know, people just clicking a button to repost. But that, that's not to say, like, it'll be um, it'll be established in every case. You know, their carelessness is not itself a defense. So it's your responsibility, essentially, to make sure that yeah. what you're posting or reposting is yeah. factual and basis and not... Yeah something you assume to be factual because you've read it or you've seen it on social media. Yeah, like something that comes to mind as a, a potential example, maybe if you repost, um, you know, like a news article that purports to be true, where, you know, it may have actually been manipulated uh, at some point within the middle of it, but it's reposted and, you know, you had no way of knowing that there was an element that was false as opposed to something that was overtly you know, a bit of an extreme statement that doesn't purport to be from an from a, an authorized source or something like that. Okay. Suzanne asks, could the testimony of an individual who witnessed the situation be used as a defense? Like, For I sure. guess yeah, yeah, yeah it, it could be. It could be used to help establish the truth to something. But, you know, again, it's case by case. I can't say in any way that you know, the testimony of one individual would be enough to establish truth. It would all, it, it would depend on the specifics of that example. You know, for a lot of people that know much about the court process, testimony tends to be a fairly um, light uh, weightiness to it in terms of, you know, the, the strength of the evidence. But that's not to say, you know, you could still definitely rely on that if it's a uh, legitimate source. So it might be one block of a defense, but it's not guaranteed to be to be a whole defense like like yeah. truth is. Exactly. Okay. Again, it, it would depend if this was a testimony from an event that happened yesterday versus fifty years ago. Again, the the strength of that uh, testimonial will will vary greatly. And presumably, how truthful that person has has proven to be in other situations. Okay. Rohit wonders that if we if um, We'll be able to distribute a PDF of these slides uh, after no the problem. Event. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, Victoria asks: Is it true? Is true that absolute defense, even if the the uh, comment is critical? For example, if criticizing the pro documented practices of a company or industry. It can be. I'm not sure how it would apply to that specific example, but absolute privilege is another type of defense where yes, it is, an, it is an absolute defense. So if you make say pejorative statements about a mining company's activities, uh, and if the, the mining company's activities are known to be what they do, but your opinion of them is X, uh, is that a defense? Correct. Okay. Uh, Samantha says, does leaving the names out and just writing about a given situation protect you? I assume it would be almost impossible to prove something that was experienced by one person. Yeah, I'm not sure about the, the last part of that statement, but yes, if you remove the names completely and you're just speaking to an event, again, if there's, if there's no individual that the statement is being attributed to, then it's not, it's not defamatory. 
Uh, but again, I'll just going back to it, it's contextual. If you're still able to connect the dots to, you know, a party, even if like a name's not, not being used, but there's an event that pertains to that party and, you know, there's a lot of other identifiers, it all depends on like the, the whole rather than the, the micro pieces of the, of the narrative. Yeah, I guess with all this stuff, that's that's the case, right? I mean, it's all yeah. in the end context. Um, exactly. Jane asks, do diary count? Do diary entries count as evidence it happened? Uh, as evidence something happened? It, it, yeah. Again, it could be a piece of evidence. It's it's not assured if it'll be everything that's needed to establish truth. But again. You know, a diary itself isn't necessarily the most reliable indicator, but it might be used as a piece of evidence. Okay. Because presumably diary entries are subjective in and of themselves. Exactly. That's what jumps to mind for me. Yeah. Uh, Joanne is writing, uh, I'm, I'm writing about uh, my experiences help, helping people downsize and declutter. Some of these people were or are hoarders. I think you're talking about me, Joanne. I don't know, but uh, is changing their name and or gender enough? What else do I need to be aware of? I'm sorry, Jane. It depends on exactly what you're writing about. I, I can't speak to that without kind of, you know, understanding the whole of the narrative of that, of what's being discussed. Um, you know, a, another kind of alternative route that I mentioned is, you know, having something like an appearance release signed by that individual that allows you to use, um, you know, their name or whatever details, or in, in other cases, it might be known as like a life rights agreement. So um, for those of you that write nonfiction, if you're writing, for example, a story about uh, his, uh, someone from the past or about a real life person, you know, it's, it's advisable to have a life rights agreement put into place that it essentially grants you the rights to use that person's story and use their name and life details and all of that. Um, so that's another way to kind of another avenue to protect yourself from uh, a claim of defamation. What about, um, and I don't know if this is what Joanne's doing or not. Uh, I haven't got all the way through the questions here, but what happens if you use composite identities? You know, like if you are, if you're interviewing a lot of different personalities, like like uh, these hoarders, and you don't want, you assume that hoarding is a pejorative term, uh, mm -hmm. so you don't want to identify them. Could you use a composite and say up front uh, that you're using composites uh, to protect uh, to protect privacy, kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's that's one option. And you see in a lot of media, whether it's on TV, uh, sometimes movies, sometimes books, you'll you'll see the disclaimer that says, you know, names have been changed to protect the identities of real life people or, you know, a var variation of that kind of disclaimer that, you know, it's outwardly saying this is based on, based in reality, but we've changed details. And a lot of the time that's used partly as a protection to, to a claim of defamation. Uh Suzanne asks, if photography and videos of a situation are publicly published, do, do those photographs or videos then become part of the public record? So can you repeat that one? Sure. So I guess if somebody, so if photographs or videos of a situation are publicly published, does that then constitute part of the public record? Like, can you rely, I think, on those videos or photographs to establish causation of yeah assuming that so that that media is verifiable i would say yes but again in this day and age there's a lot of fake media out there and there's a lot of ways to manipulate information so you know if you have a way to be assured that that you know those photos or videos are in fact real and not edited or manipulated then yeah, that, that would be, again, one piece of evidence that you could rely upon. Yeah, I guess the whole fake information really, really shakes up, right? Uh, yeah. Defamation, because presumably the responsibility is still on the individual not to defame, to assume that the individual can see through uh, fake information and discern what is true and what is false, right? Yeah, and that's why, again, you have to really do your due diligence 
I wouldn't go writing some some piece on something if you're just you know looking at some one like one single video or you know a couple of videos from the same source. Like make sure you do like a full full examination of whatever the story is that you're that you're wanting to write about. Okay, so to go back to Todd. Remember, I I mentioned him earlier to put it into the chat, and he was the mm -hmm. question about errors and omissions. Yeah. So his uh, his follow up clarification was: I produce educational critical documentaries where interviewees make statements. I am also the script writer and choose which parts of the of the interviews to use in a doc. So he's okay. you know he get I guess he's he's interviewing, but then in the choices and editing, he's putting forward, uh, assumptions can be made of what he puts in and what he puts what he puts out, right? Because he's he's creating a narrative based on what he edits. Yeah, again, what, like, it, it, just in general, you know, if you're the director, editor, or anything like that, how you edit someone's words will itself create a new statement. So be aware, be aware of that, that, you know, not only can you as the filmmaker potentially create a defamatory statement um, against, you know, some third party, but depending on how you um, edit someone's interview, for example, you know, that interviewee could say that, you know, you have defamed them in the way that you have manipulated what they've said. So that that's another element, you know, you probably have to really splice things together to go that far, but it's just kind of one idea to keep in mind too just the nature of what a statement is yeah i guess that's that that last piece where you say the nature of the statement like are you editing it together in a way that's obviously disparaging critical targeted or yeah. are you editing it together uh more uh not nicely but more uh neutrally yeah because for example if you remove one piece of what that person has said you remove, you know, a piece of context of what their their own statement is. Perhaps, you know, they don't look that intelligent in the end because, you know, they say you pull just one piece, one sentence out of a broader statement. You know, you are then manipulating what they say. So it's just something to keep in mind in, in that regard. Uh, Rohit asks, uh, when defamation occurs online. Which jurisdiction does it fall under? In some countries, defamation is civil, while in some it is criminal, I believe. He says. That's a very good question. You know, you can follow up with an email after that. That's a much broader conversation that I'm not going to get into right here because that, you know, deals with conflicts of law and it's, it's kind of outside the scope of what this conversation is, but happy to kind of have a separate conversation about that. So I'm going to ask, and we're 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 paused on the questions here in the chat. But if anybody has more questions, but I'll ask you a couple in the meantime. Um, yeah. When uh, I guess the question of so what can a writer do? Uh, like what um, you know, and maybe we can talk a little bit about ALAS. Uh, you know, I used to be a magazine publisher, and so questions of defamation were uh, were always there. There's certain uh, certain handful of individuals in Canada, if you write anything about them, uh, they'll always, uh, they'll always rattle the change of defamation. And we just had a very nice lawyer uh, who would uh, give his time pro bono to review. Um, but most people don't have that, right? And, and uh, you know, the magazine was lucky to, uh, to be able to call on people. Um, so what resources are out there for writers who may not either have the connections or the, the money? Uh, to contemplate how to uh, how to get opinions on this, other than Didi's uh, Didi's uh, uh, lunch and learns. Yeah, so there there are you know organizations that exist like ALAS is a perfect example of you know you can reach out to them and see in what capacity they're able to assist you. Um, there is the internet for better or worse, and in that regard, I've gone to this slide just to give you the link to our firm's website where. We post a number of blogs on relevant topics, a lot uh, relevant for writers. I believe there's one on defamation, but I'm actually not certain about that. But you know, going to you know more verifiable sources for for information, like law firms often have blogs. Ours is a free blog, I should add, that has information. Um, you know, you can kind of find some good resources there. We're always happy to. Uh, have a conversation and assist you in you know whatever capacity we're able to. Um, 
you know, there there are resources. The the free legal ad, uh, advisory organizations are are great uh, are great to to reach out to. Um, what I wouldn't advise is you know deep diving um, on your own within the internet without you know no, understanding that you know the variance of the sources of of writing online. Um, if that answers the questions. Yeah, no, and I'm going to ask you how you. Uh how you engage with clients with a bit of a preface. Uh, so when my last novel came out, I was threatened with a defamation lawsuit. Um, well, actually it related, it wasn't defamation because it was an institution, not an individual uh, who I won't name, uh, um, who argued trademark infringement, right? So it was, a. I, I, I assume it was a very similar in the sense that they uh, they said that I had in, infringed their trademark by using their name in my novel uh, and that it had defamed the reputation of the institution. Um, and it was a very interesting, it was, you know, it's a entirely terrifying, terrifying. I also happened to have COVID at the time, so it was not the best week, but it was a terrifying thing to come up against as an individual writer who doesn't have experience in the law to come up against that kind of um, a much more powerful institution than you. And you think, oh my goodness, I've spent seven years writing this bloody book. What am I going to do now? And my publisher going to hate me. And but in fact it was, it all it all worked out in the end. I did, I did consult a lawyer and uh, and the changes uh, were very practical in the end, which is something I've really gotten off of this slide. You know what I think as a as your slides as a writer your first instance is to say, I'm going to, you know, my words are sacrosanct. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, my right to say this stuff in the public realm. But in fact, we don't have a unfettered right to say anything in the public realm. Uh, and the process of working with the lawyer to have him review the novel and to advise on a series of changes on a scale. This is what you must do. This would be nice to do this, you know, this you could consider uh, was really, was actually a really positive experience to me. So I'd love for you as a, as a practitioner, as a lawyer who often works with creatives uh, to talk just about, I, and I know it's going to be case by case, it's going to be different if it's a musician versus a writer, but generally, how do you engage with uh, terrified creatives? Yeah, so like, I, I think I'm happy to hear that you had a positive experience. I can kind of run through just briefly, like, how we would work with with you in that kind of situation, and it kind of reflects sounds like what, what what you said. But what we try to do is we focus on the practical, as you said, and that's why I kind of left it on the last slide for a while because at the end of the day, that was more just you know the practicalities of of you know the questions to ask, the kind of trains of thought to go through as you're writing, as opposed to you know more the legal jargon in the in the preceding slides. And that's when we're working with a writer. You know, the first step will be to you know, examine the passages or the the work that that has the questions attached to it about the the nature of defamation. So we'll do a full analysis of you know our thoughts on on the piece that's been presented to us. So we'll kind of do a, a risk profile, and from that we'll have a discussion with you. We'll talk about um, you know what is the, you know what are the objectives of your of your writing? What are your hopes out of you know the messages you're you're trying to get across, and if there are you know some risks or or notions of of defamatory statements there, you know as kind of mentioned previously, you know are these necessary? Are can these be adjusted in any way to lower the risk? So we'll kind of after the the main like risk assessment, we'll kind of go through the option of like what's available to you in order to you know keep your work intact to the best of our ability while also minimizing the risk. Or getting it to a level of risk that you are comfort comfortable uh, proceeding with. So it's kind of you know it's a very much a practical conversation as as you're saying, Helen. Um, obviously, everything that we talk about with our clients is, is completely confidential. Um, so you know we never divulge stories uh, or you know talk about our cases with clients to anyone else. So everything is confidential, and we just try to work uh, as much as we're able to towards a, uh, to a resolution that, that our clients are, are happy with. And I would say to all, there's another question I'll ask in a minute. I would say to all of the writers on this call, um, 
you know, it's, it's, this is a really important uh, topic, as I personally found out, but that's in part because uh, almost all contracts, whether you have an agent or not, written in Canada these days, uh, put all of the responsibility on this stuff on the writer, right? So almost no publishing houses, big or small, uh, take responsibility for reviewing this material anymore. You need to, in your contracts, the vast majority of contracts, you indemnify your publisher against defamation. So if anybody sues you, as soon as the book tries to get an injunction, you're on the hook legally and financially for defending, not your publisher. That's not the way it used to be. It's not the way it used to be. Um, and so that's why this is really important. A, make sure the contract you sign is a, is a, is a, a writer friendly, but B, even writer friendly houses all require you now to, uh, to indemnify them. So uh, yeah. it is something to really pay attention to. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, you know, to uh, provide some context to that. So in the agreements that you're mentioning, Helen, this might be, you know, your publishing agreement. It might be uh, other agreements, it might be your insurance. There's a section called war, uh, representations and warranties. Essentially, these are a bunch of statements that you are affirming are true or correct by signing the agreement. And so one of the statements that are often there is that you are affirming that there is no content in your work that uh, is of a defamatory nature. So right then and there, you are saying that, you know, there nothing, there won't be a claim for defamation from whatever I've written. And by and so you're signing your name to that. And that ties into the indemnification that Helen mentions, where later on, if someone sues, you know, they would likely sue the publisher for defamation if someone had a sense of that then the publisher would then turn to you and say, well, you made a representation that there's nothing defamatory. So, you know, you're technically in breach or this is based on, you know, what you've said in this agreement. So we're going to turn to you to defend this claim and everything like you'll have to pay for it and everything essentially falls on you, uh, which is what Helen says. And so, you know, that's partly why it's important to uh, be quite critical of your own work uh, understand the scope of defamation, and again, do everything in your power to question whether, like, the critical elements of what you're saying, if they're necessary, if they're disparaging, and what you can do to limit that ri that risk. Uh, so Joanne has a follow up question. Uh, if you remember, Joanne was the one writing the the nonfiction book about hoarders. Uh, yeah. It, so. If I write about working with people who hoard, that's a nicer way to say hoarders. I shouldn't have said hoarders. Uh, if I change their names and state at the beginning, this is a work of fiction loosely based on personal experiences. Does that increase her uh, her defensibility, decrease her risk? Yeah. So, Joanne, it's still case by case. So we'd have to kind of dig into exactly what's being said. The, like doing doing those things will help to you know, lower that level of risk, but it all depends on like the overall uh, scope of what you're of what you're saying. Uh, again, just remove yourself from the equation. Look at everything that relates to whatever individual, whether it's fiction or or nonfiction, and say like, will this connect to a real life person? Can someone reasonably connect what I'm writing to a real life person? It sounds like it's unlikely based on what I'm hearing. You know, there's a lot of people that ha have issues with hoarding, but Again, if you have like a full physical description, if you say they live on Elm Street or whatever, you know, you start to put pieces in that uh, help to create that uh, identifiability. So if that's a word, so it really, it's all contextual at the end of the day. We'll go with it. Uh, she says, if I called a fictitious character in my novel, a Trump supporter, does that expose me to defamation by Donald Trump? Uh, I wouldn't think so. Yeah, because what you're doing is grouping a type of personality, using a shortcut. You're not, you know, maybe Donald Trump probably thinks a double a Trump supporter is not uh, is not defamation, right? Yeah. Again, what is the nature of that comment? Is it disparaging to the supporter or to Trump? And you know, that's the kind of analysis you have to you have to uh, take. Well, I think also just practically, like in all of this, I also took from your slides, 
the need to uh, look at probabilities, right? So how likely is it? Like, because you can't, in anything, you can't completely Teflon yourself away from risk under law, in whether it's defamation or anything else. You know, yeah. somebody trips on your stairs, you can't completely protect yourself there either. But it's yeah. all about probabilities, right? How likely it is that somebody will successfully bring a suit against you. The challenges with defamation is that you need to uh, defend yourself at law, right? You can't yeah. you can't just ignore this and have it go away. Right, because, you know, at the end of the day, you can't stop someone from bringing a suit. That's something that I have to, you know, communicate often. It's just how do we um, increase the defensibility and, you know, minimize the risk of the claim being successful. But at the end of the day, you can't stop someone from suing. You can only, you know, uh, put a bit of a bubble around yourself to protect yourself. Okay, Fazila has one last question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. It's 126. Uh, could you speak a little bit more about truth in fiction and how that might work? How common is it for fiction to be defamatory? Well, then fiction cannot be defamatory. You know, if if the thing is inherently fictional, then, you know, it, it's, it's made up. So it doesn't sound like it's based on any real life person or anything like that. So, you know, who... So again, going back, who would be the potential person to bring a claim here if it's all fictional? Well, I mean, I guess it can be thinly. I mean, as I said, my novel, but that was a trademark infringement, uh, not exactly defamation. That's true. Yeah, that, that's a different situation. One, yeah. one thing that's relevant, though, is, you know, sometimes um, people will do, you know, some things called clearances where you'll get a company to, you know, read through a manuscript or a screenplay or something like that. And they'll do a search on, for example, all of the characters' names that are in that work to see if they are, if there actually are real life people that have that name. So, you know, it's something to keep in mind. You can do that loosely yourself. Uh, this is something because you might not even know that who you're writing about actually, you know, if you're writing about Michael Duloff who lived in Toronto, but you don't know that that person exists, but in, in fact, he's a real person. You know, you could be sued for defamation that way, too, without even knowing it. And that's kind of one of the elements that I mentioned uh, previously. There doesn't need to be intent here. Yeah, that that's happened to me once, too. OK, this has to be really the last question. Thanks, guys. Uh, well, uh, Fazila said so fiction seems to be seems to be a defense, even though context, it would be clear that the writer is writing about a specific person. It's that's not that it's it's not that it's a defense. I mean, it's that it's not defamatory. Not defamatory. Okay. So the last question by Rohit. It is my understanding that the defamation considerations in court are quite different with public figures like Trump, especially political figures, as civilians are allowed to make comments on public policy. So in the Trump case, I think it would look very different. It would be looked at very differently as compared to a common man. Isn't that correct? It, it all depends, but yes, it, it can change. And part of that is also looking just at that individual's reputation as it stands already. So looking at, at whether what you're saying, does it actually lower their reputation more or you know, what is the status quo of their reputation as is? Well, I guess we could do a whole nother one on slap lawsuits in Canada, <laughs> but not today, not today. Right now, I want yeah. to thank you, Michael, so much for uh, sharing your time and expertise with us. I want to... Thank uh, ALAS, the Artist Legal Advice Services, for uh, bringing Michael to us. Um, and I want to thank all of you for, for attending and having uh, such great questions. I've learned a lot from all of you, so I really, really appreciate that. Uh, and Michael has generously agreed to share the slides, so Christian will send that out to everybody. Yes. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. It's always fun. It's a bit of a fun topic to get into. And you know, feel free to reach out if you have any follow-up questions and you know, look forward to seeing your works out there. Sounds great. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.